Hello to our viewers in the United States and a good evening to our viewers in Europe. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. Thank you for joining us today. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, for the first time, the Democratic and Republican national conventions are being held as virtual events on national television. With dozens of speakers each day, this new format is like a highly choreographed Zoom event with viewers tuning in from across the country and around the world. Nearly 23 million Americans watched the Democratic National Convention live on television Wednesday night, and that does not count all of the viewers who followed along via social media or live stream. In a normal year, foreign visitors would be able to attend the convention as well, but not this year. But that doesn't mean that people were not watching from abroad. I'm delighted to welcome three Bundestag members on a Friday evening in Europe who've been following this week's DNC. Thomas Andel has been a member of the Christian Social Union or the CSU since 1991 and involved in local politics in Lower Bavaria since 1993. Since 2017, he has been a member of the Bundestag and he sits on the Foreign Affairs Committee and heads the subcommittee on foreign, cultural, and educational policy. Tomas, thank you for joining us from Croatia and from your vacation. Hello, together, thank you. After cutting his teeth as a member of the parliament in the free and Hanseatic city of Hamburg, Metin Hakverdi was elected to the Bundestag in 2013. He is a member of the Social Democratic Party, or the SPD, and serves on the Finance Committee and the Committee on European Union Affairs. In addition, he's part of the German-American Parliamentary Friendship Group and the German-Israeli Parliamentary Friendship Group. Metin, herzlich willkommen. Hi. And Alexander Kulitz is a member of the Bundestag for Baden-Württemberg, and he represents the Free Democratic Party, or FDP. He serves as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, as well as a deputy member of the Subcommittee on Foreign, Cultural, and Educational Policy, the Committee on Economic and Energy Affairs, and the Committee on Labor and Social Affairs. Alex, I'm happy that you can join us. Well, thanks for having me here. So all three of you are political junkies, and, and let me <laughs> just ask whether any of you have attended a national convention in the past, in person. No. None of you have, but all of you have watched them closely, and obviously, even as a viewer from afar, this year was very different because of the pandemic. Um, a lot of the pomp and circumstance was missing, but the online format also created some, some really interesting opportunities. I'd like to ask each of you in, in broad brushstrokes, what stood out to you about the Democratic Convention this week? Metin, do you wanna give us a, a, a first reaction? Well, it's an easy question because obviously everybody who was running for presidency was in and cheering for Mr. Biden now. So the big difference, uh, especially comparing to last time, but even uh, the ones before is, is this unity in the Democratic camp that they really know what is at stake and uh, to get Mr. Trump out of office. And that was a demonstration. It was a super hardcore demonstration. I was really impressed. You could make a little difference between where they were sending their their messages from when you're really close to Mr. Biden, then you send your message from from your kitchen table, as I saw. And if it's a more, little more formal, then you get from the office. But at the end, everybody was in it, and I think they were pretty convincing. So I think uh, the Democratic Party is up to par, uh, and that's the big difference compared to four years ago. And Thomas, what about you? Any any sort of uh, thoughts on on this convention as opposed to previous conventions? Yeah, I mean, usually it's, it's always a big show, and I remember many years ago watching the Republican convention with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, this uh, was kept in my mind somehow, um, and, and this time I think without the the surrounding um, situation and, and all the people, I think. You could more focus on on, the, on really the speeches, and, and it's good to see that such a setup works because we may need to do it in Germany as well uh, in this way. Uh, so it was interesting to see uh, how things were set up there, and, and that uh, it 
works. And I think uh, you're not that distracted from, uh, from um, um, yeah, the surroundings, but could focus on, on the speeches. And, and that was something um, what was outstanding. And from, from a content point of view, it was pretty much yeah, attacking uh, Trump, of course. Um, maybe too much on attack and not so much on the own content on positions, let's say in, in the first observation. Um, but I think we will discuss that, uh, that later on. But overall, it was good to see that online works. Mm -hmm. that, that this format can actually have an impact and, and can reach people. And, and what about you, Alex? Well, definitely. I think you already stated it. Um, the thing that was missing this year was definitely the show, this kind of what we, like uh, Thomas said, Arnold Schwarzenegger putting up all this pump and circumstances that what you just stated earlier on, this definitely was missing. Um, but probably this is quite a good thing that we are moving back a little bit in political uh, debates from the, the is having these shows, having these massive kind of events for, for people where the happening is actually more of, a, in, of an interest for the viewers than the than the than the content um, like Thomas stated and I believe this has probably changed and um, of course it's very difficult to know what people really do in front of the screens in front of the TVs whether they pay attention to what is being said or whether they just flip in and then um, uh, do something completely different so usually we see that in online formats the uh, um, kind of, of uh, um, well, the, the discipline is not as, as, as good for, for listeners as it is in live events. But on the other hand, I completely agree with Thomas. I very much like the way that you could really uh, enjoy the speeches, like in small kind of video formats, um, joining in whenever you're interested in, in knowing, okay, I just want to hear the comments from Kamala Harris. I want to hear the comments from Obama. Um, and I believe this um, gave the format a very interesting, it's kind of a new prototype of convention probably. And I believe there's uh, many benefits to it. So let's see what will happen. And of course, we're very interested what will happen next uh, with the Republican um, uh, um, a convention. But um, I think this might be a format that does also work for the future if there's no COVID times. Going away a little bit from the show more for moving forwards to um, to content. Well, it, maybe, it, it maybe will one, certainly be one thing. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Go one ahead. maybe one sentence to add. I think all main speakers manage to also transport the emotions. Um, I mean, Obama anyway, but but also uh, Biden yesterday. Great speech, and and usually, if in, in such a streaming situation, it's maybe not not easy to to have these emotions transported, but I think they all manage it very well. So I, I was just going to say it will, it will be very interesting um, when we reconvene next Friday and reflect on the Republican convention. Um, to compare the two a little bit, because you know, right now, following the the Democratic convention, we only have this one example, um, and certainly it will be interesting to see how the Republican convention responds to some of the issues that were that were raised. Um, Metin, you you said that you were struck by the unity um, of the candidates um, that we heard from throughout uh, the the four days of the convention. And I, I guess, you know, unity is maybe one important theme that the convention set out to, to present. But what were some of the other themes for each of you that you, you felt um, were front and center? Um, certainly as I was watching, I found myself thinking about empathy a lot and about the fact that, that Joe Biden can, per, you know, personify that um, sentiment very, very strongly obviously leadership. I mean, it's a convention, so leadership is an important issue. But what were some of the, the critical themes that jumped out to you as you were watching? Well, I, do you mean critical for the Democratic candidate or critical um, as, imp as an critical important? As in, as in important for the, for the campaign and for I the think country moving forward. The Obama speech was, um, if, obviously, this he, he is uh, that's an important framing for the whole campaign, what he's saying. So, so the, uh, the, the idea not only of the sympathy and for, for the emotional thing that is behind this special tie of the population to the former president, um, but I think this, uh, this really technical constitutional issue of 
who's that guy in the White House right now? And uh, we are having a, a legal issue with him. He's, he's destroying the country. He's, he's destroying the, the, the technical, the constitutional setup of the country. Um, I think that was an important, an important issue through all the speeches. Um, because obviously it was difficult to, if you have, I think there were over, over 20 speeches um, combined um, in those four nights. And it's difficult not to get into a repeating me method of, of, of just saying this is a stupid guy in the White House and we have to replace him. Um, I think this issue of that it's dangerous for the country, um, literally dangerous this person because he's harming the institutions, um, I think that will be a subject that will be carried through. I think that um, to the unity issue, um, especially with this vice president, um, this uh, hopefully vice president, uh, Mrs. Harris, uh, do you remember uh, last year, uh, exactly during this time in the first debate, how Mrs. Harris and Mr. Biden uh, in, the, in the debates in Orlando, how they were fighting with each other. It was... Um, Basically, everybody thought they will never speak with each other again for the rest of their lives. It was it was so it was ugly. Actually, I think it was ugly. Um, and you, it's. I think uh, I'm convinced that there's nothing between them. I'm 100% convinced that they are really all into this um, to replace the president. So um, I think that the main subject of the of, till November will be, of course, besides important issues that come up as, as the corona crisis and economic issues of that, obviously, that will be played all the time. But the, the main, so the center focus is this, this president is, is, uh, is, is destroying the country as we know it. Um, and I think that will be carried through. And Thomas, in, in your initial comment, you, you talked about the fact that sort of the, the show was not there, it wasn't as much of a show, but the, the focus was on, on speeches. And yet, there weren't as many policy prescriptions as you might have liked to have, have seen. The, the speeches were maybe a little warmer and, and fuzzier and not necessarily as, as deep. I certainly felt that the first two days were l light on policy. Um, the third day of the convention seemed to address a number of, of more policy issues. Um, but I guess the, the same question to you would be, what were, what were sort of the main themes that came across and were there some policy um, elements that jumped out at you? I, I think the, the key word is really uh, unity because um, a divided country cannot focus on the future challenges. And I think uh, what Trump uh, did really was to divide the country, to divide the people uh, I mean, this is his tactics, of, obviously, but uh, I think that's the main challenge for a new president or the new president uh, to unite uh, the people again. And, uh, and therefore, that's really the keyword. So it's not just the, the unity of the uh, Democratic Party, but all of this, uh, the challenge and, and the main uh, yeah, position and task for the new president. Uh, to unite uh, the people and, and therefore this is for me the keyword uh, taking out of mm -hmm. the speeches, so to say. Mm -hmm. and, and Alex, how about you in terms of, of themes that you thought were well conveyed, conveyed during the convention? Well, I believe this was this was also the strategy from the from the um, Democrats. Um, if you look at the we together and uh, kind of this unificating um, um, aspects that were part of actually almost every speech that I heard at least. But the thing that uh, struck me a little bit is if you really listen into the, it's true that all of the speakers were very emotional and of course um, the attacks uh, on uh, the Trump administration, especially the failure of uh, the COVID um, management, etc., cetera, um, was pointed out very well. But um, I believe, uh, or the thing that struck me a little bit, if you listen to the speeches, especially um, on the candidate itself, Mr. Biden comparing always this light and darkness. So it's not only emotional, it's also a little bit, um, I would say there's, um, uh, it, it, if you listen to it a little bit, it could also be a Hollywood movie in a way. So pushing up the story <laughs> up to a certain, um, it's, uh, um, well, probably, but this is probably one of the big differences, cultural differences. I believe that that's, what, that's how you address Americans. That's how you catch them. You just need to put out the emotions. 
German people wouldn't be uh, catch wouldn't be catched by these this form of, of address um, that easily. So probably we are based more on facts and 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 figures, and we just want to hear some exactly policy kind of things. Whereas it's not so interesting for the American viewers. They just need to feel the emotion. They need to touch the emotion. And the way they did it by putting up these pictures, darkness and light, or um, or also the, the former President Obama putting out this, um, this he cannot grow into office, he's not able to grow into office. And these kind of um, drawing these pictures, I think that made this convention also a bit uh, different probably, because I see that they were trying to pull the show a little bit into the, into the comments rather than doing it with, uh, with pure techniques and, and rockets and huge crowds. And so it was more of a, a different tonality, I would say, when it comes to the, to the speeches themselves. Um, and if you read at least the German media, it sounds like um, some people consider the speeches to be even more aggressive than in the past, especially from former presidents who usually hold back a little bit. But there's a German saying, the way you call into the woods, the way you'll get your response. Um, so this is kind of probably what happened also on the political side, because we're used to Donald Trump's kind of rather aggressive way of addressing things and uh, make America great again, etc. And everybody else is bad. So um, I think that was the learning I had from this convention. There was certainly um, an emphasis on this as an ex existential moment. Uh, there were a number of speakers who talked about the, the stakes being high um, and the way that that sort of manifested itself for me was also um, in a real emphasis on voting, on the importance of voting and instilling sort of a sense of urgency that people go out and vote and how to vote. Um, as Germans, right, where, where voter participation is so much higher than it is in the United States, did that emphasis on voting strike any of you as, as being odd or, or did that surprise you in any way? I think it's just uh, necessary uh, considering the situation and, uh, and the challenge for the Democrats uh, to yeah, mobilize the people and uh, motivate them to go vote. One of the things that I, I also wanted to ask you about, and, and particularly you, Alex and Metin, because you've both got sort of deep personal experiences in the United States, was what it was like um, to watch the state-by-state -state roll call from abroad. Um, it was, was very different from usual. It's, it's often the most boring part of the convention as each state reads sort of the number of, of delegates delegate votes for the, the candidates. Um, but I mean, Alex, of course, you have personal connections to Charlotte and Metin, you studied in Simi Valley, California as a, as a high school student and then at Indiana University. You've both got interesting snapshots into different parts of the country. Um, what did you think as you watched the roll call? Well, probably once again, due to the different system of democracy we have, um, I think the roll call just plays a very important role considering that there are, uh, con yes, um, considering the system itself. So I think it was Bill Clinton in his small speech who pointed out once again um, that one of the issues in the last election process already was not reaching enough people. And it's one thing to have the to have the delegates and address the delegates and get the states on your side. It's another thing to address the people and have the people to go for the ballot and to, to go voting. And I think this system, this different system is kind of why this um, roll call for, for even for me, it's, um, it doesn't have the, um, it's probably, it's, it's, it's a very important part of the, of the systemic uh, de um, democracy in, in the United States. But it doesn't play the same role for us watching it as foreigners, as foreign parliamentarians, looking at the situation and trying to also get at least a, a notion of what is happening in the United States. Of course, we're very excited, all of us, what will, what will happen in, in the election in the end. And, and of course, for us, this is kind of the beginning. Uh, it's it's uh, looking at the situation, trying to find a notion where is the whole thing leading. And the roll call does play a role, but it's not like it was surprising to me or very, very... Um, um, we're not so enthusiastic, I guess, about it. Mm -hmm. 
and and Mitchie, um, did you have any? I don't know what, do you remember? Do you remember last time uh, when when Vermont was giving their votes uh, uh, for Hillary Clinton? Do you remember that? So, so I think that was pretty. Remember well, I remember that. So um, I think they are always special. Come on, they are always. If you, if you look at the races and all the all the uh, states you had before, uh, when candidates drop out. Um, there was a there was a California president. The the candidate of Cal, one Californian uh, candidate dropped out first in the in the Democratic race. Uh, Eric Swalwell. So California is also interesting. But to me, it's, well, when I saw Pete Buttigieg <laughs> for Indiana, that was super cool. Of course, right? Super cool right. because actually, I I thought okay, this guy might be back in twelve years, right? Because he's he's so young, he could be there at any time. So um, no, I think. Um, it was it was special because it was this digital surrounding. Uh, it was sort of awkward. Um, usually, you have this this party show. And I really I, I miss the party. Actually, I'm I'm into this stuff. I like the mm -hmm. the campaigning mode they are getting early on. Um, don't forget. Usually, if it wasn't for Corona, this would be the the starting point of a of a ground warfare. Um, yeah till November to a lot of people out in the street move them from one state to the other to knock at doors of people not only not of their neighborhood but not even living in the state so that will be different this time so uh, it was it, it was awkward it was awkward but it was cool to see all those locals uh, into that and especially of course I, th I thought I, I haven't thought about this before you asked um, and I think of Pete Buttigieg was pretty cool <laughs> because he was really he was standing there really tough as as I, I could do this as well if you ask me but this time it's for Joe so um, I found him cool but um, the unity is just not only compared to last time and the Clinton issue before but uh, historically seen the Democratic Party this is one thing Mr. Trump uh, managed to do they are they are serious man they are so serious about getting this uh, done together um, even if if uh, if if Bernie Sanders is truthfully <laughs> promoting Joe Biden. You know, uh, if you're a Republican, you know trouble is coming. So one last point to the, the roll call, um, and, then, and then I do want to move on because I do think that this issue of unity is, is important, um, is that the way it's been perceived here is as a real reminder for a lot of people about the geographic and ethnic diversity in this country. Um, and that's something that we haven't really talked about, right? Diversity um, in the U.S., especially um, before the backdrop of the Black Lives Matter movements in the U.S. has taken on a completely new role uh, in, in politics as well. And by being able to have these short videos um, as part of the roll call, it was a way of really highlighting just how diverse this country really is um, and and trying to be inclusive. And I think that that's something that you're talking about, Mentine, as well, of the unity within the Democratic Party, uh, the big tent that is often discussed of trying to be inclusive. And yet, um, you know, there has been some criticism in the U.S. that some of the progressives have been, been left out. Um, Julian Castro, for example, who was also uh, running for president, did not have I think any visibility um, during the convention, um, and certainly some of Biden's opponents had more visibility than others. Um, how how did you perceive the the inclusion or lack thereof of sort of the more progressive wing um, of the Democratic Party? Was that an issue? Is this to me? To any of you, actually. I, of the the democratic camp has its problems and it, it this is a long story okay this is not new for 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 this part of of the campaign um and obviously by choice this is all left beside for for campaigning reasons to get to get to november um all in one vote as we would say in in, in german so um the problem of of the I would say polarization within the Democratic Party, or let's say Democratic camp, because some of them are not even members of the Democratic Party, that will continue to be a problem, of course, a challenge, but also on the, on the, on the Republican camp. So this is something that's not, that's not unique to the American system. Uh, we got this in Germany as well, and it doesn't show that 
that clearly because we have more parties than two. Um, but uh, this is not new. It will happen again. I don't know whether, I know that people stop the time, how long people talked in, in, in over those four days. Um, and you will see that will be a lot easier next week for the Republican Party because they're... Nijin, I think we've lost you. Well, that's... Uh, but uh, Thomas or Alex, <laughs> yeah. Thomas or Alex, is there anything that either of you would like to add to that point? Well, I think it, it doesn't, like if your campaign is on unity and you really want to show this unity and you want to forward it, it doesn't make sense to give too much space to very progressive uh, kind of um, uh, wings or, or ideas. Um, I'm, I'm quite sure this will happen later on in the, in the uh, uh, campaigns. Um, and I'm quite sure these voices will arise much stronger um, but I believe right now, at this very moment, I wasn't missing on the on the progressive voices uh, simply to, due to the fact I believe the strategy is um, to show this kind of unity, to put the we together, which was kind of the, the motto, to put it up front. And um, if you have too many, I would say, um, well, uh, progressive voices, it gets difficult. But that's I, I wasn't missing on the progressive voices. I'm quite sure they will arise as time goes on. Yeah, and Thomas, did you have any thoughts to that? You agree? I agree. I um, agree with you. We've gotten a couple of viewer questions that, that tie in nicely here. Um, one of our viewers writes, to the point of unity, how do you feel about the lack of young people speaking at the convention? How important is it for the Democrats to get the millennial and Generation Z vote? Um, is that something that any of you would like to, to comment on? Well, of course, it's important to get uh, the votes of the younger generation, whether this is really a, a topic or a, a problem in the convention, not, not sure. I think it's up to the campaign to, to address these, uh, these generations. And I guess um, uh, they, will, they will address this. I mean, what, what I was recognizing uh, during the Biden speech at in, in, in some points, you saw that it's a 77-year-old man, right? He swallowed some words, and uh, so you could recognize that. So I think this is definitely a challenge in the in the campaign to make people, and especially the younger generation, aware uh, um, that their challenges, their topics, are are not missed by but it's an older candidate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another viewer question um, asks how it struck you that there were Republicans, and in some cases quite senior Republicans, uh, speaking out in support of Biden during the Democratic National Convention. Um, obviously, there were a number of little videos of Republicans who were saying that they uh, were we're going to, to vote for Biden after having voted for Trump last time. Um, but there were a number of, of more prominent Republicans like Governor Kasich from Ohio, um, uh, Colin Powell, right? Um, uh, former Secretary of State in a Republican administration and a, a four-star general. Um, my sense was a little bit that, that those kinds of appearances um, tried to were done in an effort to help cajole Republicans into voting for Biden and making him seem like less of a risk or less scary. But how did it how did it resonate with you um, watching from from overseas? I mean, it's, this is definitely something unusual. We we don't have here in Germany. We cannot guarantee that it could never happen, but uh, but we don't have that. <laughs> but it shows. Uh, it shows how how serious maybe the situation is. I mean, naturally or formally, my party is closer to the Republicans, right? But from a policy content point of view, um, with regards to foreign affairs, for instance, um, I think we we have a lot in, in common with the Democrats, and, and it showed basically how yeah how serious also Republicans see the situation and that they. Um, make their 
their speech at the Democratic Convention. So definitely very interesting to, to see. Mm -hmm. I believe this was also a very clever tactical move because um, for one, with this digital format, um, of course, you have the, the kind of video uh, clips that you send out. So especially uh, on a tactical side, it makes a lot of sense to find um, Republicans who in this case are not happy with the um, with the with the White House and the policies, and I believe it's a, it's not a secret that many Republicans are it's kind of um, are, are not really happy with this uh, with this president and being represented by Donald Trump, because um, Donald Trump is just one facet of the of the Republican idea probably, and there's many many Republicans that are not really happy. They just stick to it because he's the most promising kind of candidate, and those who cannot join anymore it makes a lot of sense i believe on the democratic side to collect those republican voices to speak out against trump i believe it's more speaking out against trump even though i heard one or two that really um uh, were speaking for joe biden due to the fact that they were personal friends or close or personally close but it's more of uh, um, um finding the voices within the republican um, uh, party that speak out against um, uh, their own convictions if you want to. That's a tactical move which I think is very clever and uh, probably it will, um, even in the future, it will happen more often. We will see this more often taking the opponent as there is a, actually only two uh, main uh, competing parties, taking the opponent and trying to find voices to speak against their own convictions. Mm -hmm. Matt, well, there is a problem to this. Uh, well, I think this is a special situation because it's Trump is Trump. So I don't know whether this will be a, a, a weapon used in, in future campaigns because um, obviously you will have a problem of getting your folks back uh, back into the game once you have Republicans on the stage. So I think this is an exception because of Trump. And I think um, if you think in focus groups uh, during campaigning times for the election uh, on the election day, who who do you want to reach with, let's say, Colin Powell on stage? Um, at the same time, be sure not losing somebody because you let him talk. Uh, that is a problem. Remember uh, Colin Powell's role in, in the Iraqi war. Um, so I think Mr. Trump opens up that door for the Democrats to use that, to, to use a Republican in, an, in a Democratic campaign. But the Democratic Party, uh, the Republican Party is not what it, what it was four years ago. So um, I don't even know what it means to be a Republican today. So um, there are so many conservatives out in the United States that are really embarrassed by the president. Um, so some of them make it to, to say it publicly and some are not. So I, I think does it, the question, the main question remains is, is it, does Colin Powell on stage or any other Republican, even if it's not on TV, but next door neighbor, do they bring those few guys that would not consider to vote Democratic, let's say somewhere in, in, in Ohio or in, in Pennsylvania, to say, okay, this time, um, usually I wouldn't consider, but this time I do it. So, um, and I think that might be some of them, some of them. This will not get the big swing, but it, it, it gets some, somebody will be, uh, will be caught with this issue. And, you, and probably because of Mr. Trump, um, the Biden campaign is not losing on the other side, uh, let's say on the progressive side and on, on, in his camp, because they don't like it that they are Republicans and on, their, on their campaign trail, but they, they just accept it because of special, the special issue to get rid of Mr. Trump. So I think this will be I don't think we will see this again too soon, but who am I? All my foresees, usually the last four years I was wrong in foreseeing the future, so let's see. <laughs> well, I, I think it's one of those things where all of us have to wait and see. Um, one of the things that, that's always struck me about the, the differences between the German system and, and the US system is, and, and you, you might beg to differ, but it seems to me that the German system is more built on compromise and consensus. And one sees that by having different parties that work together to form a government. Um, whereas here, there's much more competition between the parties. And so um, I do think it, it says a lot that there were as many Republicans who were speaking out um, in the way that they, that they were. Um, but I'd like to maybe use this opportunity to, to sort of shift gears a little bit and talk about foreign policy. I mean, one, one never expects a, a national convention 
um, to really put foreign policy front and center. And yet, you know, on the periphery, there were um, some conversations, some policy points about foreign policy. Um, John Kerry, former Secretary of State, spoke, and of course, he talked about many of the, the achievements of the Obama administration um, and, and talked about the perceptions uh, of President Trump around the world, um, but also said that, that he felt that, that President Biden, that a President Biden would be respected uh, by, by others around the world. Um, and of course, you know, General Powell, um, Secretary Powell, uh, talked about Biden as somebody who would, quote, stand with our friends and up to our enemies. Um, and so there were some foreign policy vignettes, um, but do you feel that enough emphasis was put on international affairs during the convention, or do you all recognize that it's pretty much you know, an event for a domestic audience and not necessarily an international audience? I think it's an event for the domestic audience, and I also think you you can't win an election with uh, foreign affairs topics. So it's always something which, during a campaign, usually you put a little bit aside. I would I would say, but of course, uh, the situation is uh, is special, and and probably a lot of people think Trump has destroyed a lot of relationships, partnerships, and therefore it was uh, was good to to see. Uh, the, um, the speeches you mentioned and, uh, and the little fragments you mentioned, but overall, I think with uh, with the topics we are interested in, transatlantic partnership and uh, against a strategy against China or uh, all other topics we have uh, between Europe and, and the US, I think these are usually topics which uh, are not of that much interest of the American voter, I would say. The average well, I, American voter. I agree with Thomas. I believe you don't win national elections with foreign policies. And that's why I at least wasn't expecting too much foreign policy topics within the talks. But still, I think um, I, I at least try to um, uh, attentively listen to Joe Biden being the probably um, future president. Um, and he did put up some things. Um, I mean, in the chat, Tara Hariara uh, is asking whether Biden should have mentioned China more often. I don't think so. But the thing that I was really taking out of Biden's speech is that he very much focused on he wants to go along with the allies and not uh, break even further with, with, uh, with the allies all over the world and continue to I'm not sure how he said it, uh, but somehow chase the dictatorships, chase the people who do not uh, value the secrecy of democracy, the votings. That's kind of the, the how he put it. And I really took it as, um, as a foreign affairs um, topic because it was for us as transatlantic, as people who are very dear to the transatlantic um, relations, uh, it showed very much that he is, very, I believe, very much willing to um, try at least to get this, he also called it the bright light of the United States to put it back into the world. So um, not only going in confrontation with uh, even allies and uh, Trump never had an issue doing so, we still have it at the moment, talking about secondary sanctions on Nord Stream 2, talking about all these different kind of little issues that we're having. So Trump never had an issue going this way. And also I believe that even though in many ways um, we will not be able to um, sort out several issues that still exist in a transatlantic relationship. Um, I believe that Biden is somebody who has a completely different um, feeling of, of um, diplomacy, of, of the tool of diplomacy, using this to shape international relations rather than going on deals and confrontation all the time. And I believe looking at the Democratic Party also in the past, um, you mentioned John Kerry, um, who we were able to meet some time ago in, in Germany for breakfast. And I was really impressed because those, in my opinion, those are um, high class diplomats who know how to solve international uh, situations. Um, which Trump and his administration never wasn't even trying to to do so. They tried to deal it out, and uh, never it it didn't work most of the time, to be frankly and honest. And I think the German American relations at the moment are at a very bad point due to the situation, the way 
people are dealing with each other's being allies, but we don't feel being treated like allies. And uh, I hope that Biden is at least somebody who has a different opinion or a different view on how a relationship should work. And I mean, he, he published his uh, foreign affairs uh, ideas and, and positions a few days ago um, in, in a magazine. So, so for the international community, he already transported his, his positions and that, that was uh, a good, good move as well. Yeah, someone has a sense of what direction he might take. Um, I guess maybe to you, Metin, one of our, our viewers is curious um, what foreign policy initiatives should be launched from the outset of a new administration? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, first of all, I'll tell you what, what I disagree with in, 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 in some comments that, are, that were made in, in Germany and in Europe. Uh, regarding foreign policy issues, comparing uh, in case Trump wins in a second term for him and uh, compared to, to Joe Biden, uh, arguing that there won't be that much of a difference because uh, China is still China, Russia is still Russia, and Germany is still not spending 2% of, of their national product on, on, on security. So, But I truly disagree on this one. I think it will be a super big, super big difference. Um, not on each single issue, of course. Uh, it's not, so to speak, uh, policy-related differences, uh, but it is the, the greater technique, the greater scheme of, of, of the narrative of foreign policy. So um, I would compare it to the, to the America First strategy. And America First is not only um, issue-related, it is a philosophy to get legitimate to be, to be legitimized by the people of the United States. So I understood Mr. Biden and other speakers as well, of course, also uh, from President Obama, but others as well, that there is a, a deep urge for, for, this, for this more Wilsonian, the United States ex exceptionalism as making the world better. And uh, that is the opposite of America first, um, making the world better. Um, Issue-wise, within that narrative, there could be big differences also with Germany regarding other countries, of course, but I think that is a total game changer. And then the very next step, I think this is the ex uh, expectations on the German side and the European side and the Allies side is that uh, not all issues are, are over and uh, there's nothing to talk about and we, we, we all are going in the same direction. That we, it will be very, very difficult. There are some foreign policy issues around the corner that will be challenging for any uh, American administration. But the, the, the true, the, true um, um, the, the willing to, to, to do this together as allies, to have a more multilateral approach to it, uh, to be willing to talk to, to partners, to be willing to talk to, to allies. Um, I saw this morning um, uh, Ambassador Ishinga, uh, he, he invited, he, well, basically he said, well, he didn't write this, but it, he, he, he said, it, so Mr. Biden will be the first president to talk at the Munich Security Conference next year. So um, to give his new foreign policy um, uh, layout to, to Germany, um, I expect a lot from this. And that doesn't mean it's easy. That doesn't mean we are all at, at all single issues uh, really on the, same, on the same side. It will be very, very difficult in this one. But, but the whole, just, just changing the style is a big thing in foreign policy, a super big thing. And, um, and the really encouraging factor is that Mr. Biden starts this new style with talking to his people and not only in Munich or in, in Brussels. So um, this, I th thought this was very, very encouraging. Um, and to answer your first question, I was a little surprised that foreign policy took such a big part. Uh, I've, I've expected, a, come on, the corona crisis is out there, 170,000 dead Americans. There would be good reason just to talk about uh, home mm -hmm. issues. Um, so I, was re I, I think that's one of the big positive stake we are taking home to Germany uh, from this convention. Mm -hmm. Let's um, maybe, maybe switch gears a little bit again um, and talk about sort of the reaction in Germany beyond the reaction from the three of you. Um, how has the, the convention been presented in the German media? Um, do, you, do you feel that it's been a, a fair presentation? Uh, one of our viewers actually poses the question, would you agree that the coverage of, German, of the German press and public opinion 
uh, about the current situation in the United States, would you agree with the coverage of the German press and public opinion in the United States um, uh, about the situation in the U.S.? And do you think that there's a chance for the Democrats to win the election um, is being presented as being too optimistic uh, and, and too much wishful thinking the way that it was four years ago? Or do you think it's more, more balanced? No, if you listen to commentators in, in Germany, well, everybody is still heard for, from four years ago. So um, there, there, is, there are no U.S. experts anymore as experts as foreseeing yeah. results of elections. So you will not, in every single discussion out there, uh, you will either hear, um, we have no idea how this is going to end because we, we were wrong before and we could be wrong again. And the most you could hear is, if the elections were today, then Mr. Biden would win, okay? But everybody knows the elections are not today. <laughs> They're going to be in the future. So, no, we are hurt, man. We are hurt. We are having Brexit uh, at the end, at the beginning of next year. Um, see whether that's going to be a hard Brexit or not. We are having still those debates um, about uh, climate change in, in Germany as well. Polarization is still in our societies. Come on. So uh, I'm, I'm ready to get surprised uh, every day. Um, I hope uh, Mr. Trump will lose. I think it's really, it, it will be a lot better to have somebody at least to talk and to listen to. Um, but I'm, uh, it's going to be the turnout in, in the suburbia of Pittsburgh. It's going to be the turnout, um, hopefully in Ohio, uh, that will make a difference. And you never know. Come on. It's super, it could be super close. Um, so, and, and the, the German public is aware of this. Uh, there is no big mainstream media um, giving the impression this will be just a four-year period and for sure it's going to be over after four years. Not at all. Not at all. I mean, realistically Perhaps. seen, we have to, we have to, realistically seen, we have to, to see that uh, Trump delivered basically a lot for his camp. Um, a lot of uh, positions during his campaign were fulfilled at the end. But Corona or, or COVID may, may change now. I think this is something um, which makes it difficult for him. But apart from that, he delivered a lot. So, so that will be really interesting how this turns out in the election. So um, we have a lot of wishful thinking and we had that four years ago. And uh, but, but it's absolutely open. I think we are a bit more realistic now than four years ago that, uh, uh, let's say, Trump can also uh, win again, so that is uh, something we have we have in mind. To be honest, and frankly speaking, I was a little disappointed by the media coverage in Germany, especially on the Democratic um, Convention now, due to the fact, like Thomas stated, we have a very wishful thinking in Germany and I guess in Europe all over, which is more, uh, I would say, anti-Trump kind of um, resentment in the in the in society. So I was um, expecting the media at least to cover a little more on the democratic side and to show what is happening. I completely agree with Metin. The problem is nobody is willing to do any um, uh, um, pro to to have a, a prognosis in any way what will happen in the future because uh, we were wrong most of the time actually, not only last time, um, also in the media. But still, I was a bit shocked that the media is not willing to, uh, if you look even now, if you punch in Google um, uh, convention, uh, Democrats, and you hit on search and you go on news in Germany, you find hardly anything. There's very, very few comments on what happened the last few days. Everybody knows this is kind of the start of a very important uh, campaign happening in the United States. So why are we so silent about it? Why is the German media coverage so uh, lacking about it? Um, I don't really know because... Um, even on this side of the Atlantic, I believe it does make a huge impact, like Martin uh, Matin already stated, this makes a huge impact on who will be president for the future. And uh, I think it was a very, very poor coverage so far. Um, hopefully this will change when the campaign really starts, but let's see what happens. But I wasn't, I was disappointed, I have to admit. So we're used to knowing on election night or by the morning the next day who the next president will be. Uh, and we've gotten a couple questions about whether European leaders are prepared for an unprecedented situation where 
It might take days or even weeks uh, until we know exactly who the president is. Uh, someone even wrote that we might not have a decision by January 20th of inauguration day. Um, I guess the best way to sort of sum up that, that question is, um, do you have any, or what are your concerns about the potential of a contested election in the United States? And how do you think that that would view, uh, how do you think that that would impact the view that people in, around the world have of what's going on in the U.S.? Well, first of all, I, okay, this is an often asked question because obviously everybody thinks of this president could be willing to do crazy stuff, right? So um, before we try to foresee what he's going to do, um, I hope it's going to be a super clear result. So firstly, I hope it'd be cool just for at least two years to have a majority in the Senate and the House and in the White House. Um, let's see how whether that'd be that clear. The numbers do support such a result, the numbers we have now, but who knows what's going to happen in November. Um, Brown County, come on. This is not new. Um, I have no idea how the ballots are designed today. Um, so uh, people, uh, campaigns were running to courts uh, after election. This is not new. Um, what yeah. is new is the guy who is, we, we don't trust him, right? <laughs> we, we think he might, he's willing to blow up the whole thing uh, just to, to, to stay in office. Um, I don't believe that. I don't believe it because of the, because of my Republican, conservative, and Trump supporter friends I know in the United States. And uh, there's no way we can talk about politics or policies, uh, because I'm from Germany, I'm a social democrat, so it's really difficult to talk about politics. Uh, and we're just talking about the weather and personal stuff. But once we reach this point of the constitutional ground order, for some reason, I, I, I didn't hear anybody Seriously, not one single person, not one single person uh, that would accept him staying, I would say, at least after a Supreme Court decision um, to, to not be moved out of the White House immediately. So I don't see that. What I do see is that it might take a little longer than the Brown County case we had, um, because that was resolved within one day. Um, after the results got published. So if it takes two or three or four days for any reasons, could could lie in the in this in the in the court system, could lie the Supreme Court. If you look at the procedures of the Supreme Court, it's unlikely that they would decide within a day after a decision was made. Um, because the situation, at least in some communities of the United States, are so polarized that you might end up not only that uh, armed militia is not only moving into the capital of, of the great state of Michigan, but they might use their weapons. Um, that, that would be a catastrophe. Um, that would be a super big a high toll on, on, on this polarization, on this, on this hate that was, was, was on purposely brought into the society, but it will not save Mr. Trump. He has to, he will have to move out in case of, of, of uh, if, he, if he's not getting elected. But damage has been dealt already, uh, but more damage can be dealt. Also can, will be, it's possible that more things happen um, that seriously everybody will regret, but he will not stay in power. There will be no revolution. There will be not the overthrow of the government. The, all those um, revolutionary theories, they, this will not happen between November 3rd and, and, and late January. It will not happen. Yeah, I, I agree because uh, the constitution in the system will be stronger. And wasn't that uh, George W. Bush, uh, uh, Al Gore, taking also some weeks until the final result? I can't remember, but I think it was more than a few days. So we are. So and then, of course, there's also the discrepancy between the popular vote and the electoral college and, and how that plays out um, as, as well. But Alex, did you have any thoughts on the, the contested election and how that might be perceived uh, abroad? 
Um, well, to pick up the other point, I completely agree because we are talking about the United States and I strongly believe in the institutions and these institutions work. And that's probably the big difference to what we see all over the world at the moment, looking at Turkey, looking at Belarus, these very moments, looking at, um, well, Belarus never was a democracy, but putting this aside, I'm quite sure that the American system, because uh, institutions are way too strong, um, there is no way, uh, I don't see, I mean, as I said, it's virtually impossible to have predictions nowadays and how far is President Trump to go. But the institutions are so strong, he doesn't have a big option. So um, um, let's see what happens. But I strongly believe in the American institutions. I don't see it happen. Um, you were asking about the German-American relationship, uh, whether, Steve, uh, whether, whether what we will, um, what we will, um, also difficult to predict, to be honest. I don't know. Um, the problem is also on our side of the Atlantic. You know, there's many, many anti, I wouldn't say anti-American, but at least American yeah. skepticism that has, uh, uh, that has rose over the time, especially you, uh, especially with President Trump. And, uh, and it's still happening. If you, if you look into the news, if you look at what is happening, and this is kind of what the tone, what the, the, the way that diplom the way that um, Trump and his, his administration are treating also allies, and we still feel as allies in Germany, it led to a kind of a um, confusion within the population. And we had the Kerber Foundation at one point, they put up a survey asking, would you rather deal with the United States or would you rather deal with China in the German public? And uh, it was kind of scary to see how, um, much value German public still gives into the, the shared values like democracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Many people tend to trust China more than they trust the United States at the moment. I think this is very alarming also to us as politicians on the German side. Um, of course, we have to deal with both. And I'm definitely not one of the politicians who is uh, willing to join into the China bashing all the time. China is an important trade partner for us, but it's also a uh, it's also a systemic rival to to our idea of democracy, definitely. And we. We have to stick to the American idea. Whoever will be president in the future, even if Donald Trump is able to, um, and of course there's a, a big possibility that he's able to sustain an office. In this case, we need to find a way to get back on the table. And it has been way more difficult with Donald Trump than with any other uh, president before him, obviously. Um, and uh, but but in anyhow. America is our most important partner on the European side, and we need to deal with it. And if President Trump is not willing to, um, or is not uh, um, willing to uh, accept us as allies, is rather willing to see us as some kind of uh, supranational uh, institution that he's trying to divide, picking out the countries he wants to have a relationship on. Um, okay, but then we still have to show him that being a European Union also means we, as a union, um, have our own um, um, interests and we have to step up together rather than um, uh, trapping in or getting trapped in or uh, being um, um, being separated by, um, by the way that uh, at least this administration was trying to deal um, with uh, national interests on the European side rather than taking us as a union. Thank you for that. I mean, that's actually a, a great closing comment um, for today's conversation because it comes back to what's front and center for the American Council on Germany, namely the German-American relationship and the transatlantic relationship writ large. And I think, you know, obviously while it's important who's in the White House, there are a number of other connections that we have across the Atlantic and it's the responsibility of all of us to try to maintain those connections and, and strengthen those connections. Um, I had a lot more questions, um, both my questions, but also some viewer questions, but I think we've covered a lot of different issues. And um, I just want to thank all three of you for taking the time today to, to have this conversation. Um, obviously, we will all be talking about the future of the German-American relationship for a very long time, regardless of who wins the election. Uh, and I look forward to working with you and continuing those conversations, but I'm particularly looking forward to seeing all three of you again next week, when we will also be joined by Franziska Brandner of the Green Party to uh, reflect on the Republican National Convention and then perhaps juxtapose the two events with each other and, and draw some, some conclusions and some takeaways. So until then, stay well, stay healthy. Um, ein schönes Wochenende. 
you've you've earned it. Um, and thank you again for for joining us today.